Welcome to the Cleansing Word Podcast with Pastor John of Calvary Chapel, Lake Villa. Join us as we go through the Bible as we encourage your walk with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to know more about Calvary Chapel, Lake Villa, visit us at cclv.org. And please share and subscribe to this podcast. Now let's hear a message from God's Word. So we're actually finishing up Gideon's story in chapter 8. And he's still chasing down the Midianites. And so he was. Just last week we learned about Gideon being approached by the angel of the Lord and being introduced as a man of valor. And he was a man who was at the bottom of a wine press threshing grain because he was hiding from the Midianites. And he had good reason to be hiding from the Midianites because they had been oppressing the children of Israel. And every time a harvest or a crop would come in, they would come in as a multitude of people and just strip the land bare. And so the Lord approached Gideon, called him a mighty man of valor, and said that he was going to use him to deliver the children of Israel. Now, Gideon began very well with great humility. He said, we are the least tribe, and I am from the least clan in the tribe of Benjamin, and I am the least person in my tribe. So you're really, Lord, scraping the bottom of the barrel if you're coming to me. And you know, that's what God loves to do. He loves to use the weak things in this world to confound the wise. And so Gideon really began well. Yes, he questioned the Lord if he was actually going to work through Gideon or not. Gideon threw out a couple of fleece um, to test the Lord whether the word was true or not. He had already served the angel of the Lord a meal and saw a miracle just in that because the angel directed him to take the meal, set it on a rock, and then he's, the angel touched the rock with the staff and the meal was consumed on the rock and the angel ascended into heaven. So he'd already seen a miracle, but still he tested the Lord using the fleece. And we talked about that last week, how a lot of people talk about well, I threw out a fleece to the Lord. We never actually threw out a fleece to the Lord. I've never once in my life seen anybody take some lambskin, go out in the yard and lay it out in the yard, come back in the morning to check it to see if it's either wet or dry. We never literally threw out the fleece like Gideon did. But just as he requested from the Lord, so it was. One morning, the fleece was wet and the dry, ground was dry and he was able to squeeze out a bowl full of water. The next morning, the ground was dew-soaked and the fleece was dry. And so encouraged by the word of the Lord, he went forth and at first when he gave the call to battle, 32,000 men showed up. Now, that would make most of us comfortable thinking that's not bad, 32,000 men until we realized that the enemy had 135,000 men. So in comparison to the size of the army that they were about to go up against, 32,000 was really a small percentage. But God saw it as still too large. It says, I know you people. If I do a work through the 32,000, you guys will say it was us. We did it. And you will claim the glory. And so he just simply told Gideon, tell everyone who's afraid to go home. And that cut out, um, cut the numbers down to 10,000 real quick, 22,000 left. Gideon may have been thinking, that's not too bad. At least we have 10,000. God said, yep, still too many. I still know the heart of you. And uh, you'll think by the 10,000 that you saved and redeemed yourself. And so they did the test of the water, how the men drank, and only 300 were chosen. 
And with 300, Gideon was able to rout the army of the Midianites, and they're on the run. And that brings us to chapter 8. Key verse of chapter 8, verse 23. It's where Gideon said to the children of Israel who had asked him to be king over them, he said, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So that's a key verse, because at this time, Gideon had the right heart after coming through a great victory that the Lord had given him. So we begin in verses 1 through 3. We find Ephraim's rebuke. It says, Now the men of Ephraim said to him, Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. And he said to them, What have you done? What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abazir? God has delivered into your hand the princes of Midian, Orb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he had said that. So here we find, besides being a mighty man of valor and a, a great warrior, Gideon also became a diplomat and a wise judge. The Ephraimites had complained against Gideon. These were Israelites from the tribe of Ephraim who maybe when Gideon gave the call to battle, they decided not to show up. Maybe they thought, you know, the battle's really not in Gideon's favor. We'll just see how everything plays out. But everything played out very well. And so then they began to complain to Gideon. So we don't know why they were not called up or did not come to the original call of battle. We do know that Gideon's tribal family came. The tribe of Manasseh, Asher, Zubalin, Naphtali were all there to help, but not Ephraim. And yet, when the battle turned in Israel's favor, they were there. And they actually complained against Gideon. So Gideon handled this situation in wisdom and diplomacy, and thus saying, describing the gleanings of Ephraim, the capture of the princes of Midian, Orb, and Zeb, greater than the exploits of the 300, which was truly are surely not true. There was 120,000 who died under the sword of Gideon by this time, and only 15,000 remaining of the enemy at this time. And yet, he used this diplomacy, and it satisfied. And I think sometimes in life, we need to just be wise with words. And uh, sometimes learning to stay silent or to not give a lot of words. We have the wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs 15, verses 1 and 2, reminding us that a soft answer turn away, turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pour forth foolishness. So sometimes it's, good to just not worry about it. The glory was God's. Gideon knew that. And sometimes in church life, when we try to take the glory on for ourselves and forget that the glory belongs to Christ, maybe we will be concerned about, well, they had nothing to do with this. This was all my work. Rather than saying, this was all the Lord's work. And we are so glad that you're wanting to come alongside now and join us. Even though you came late to the party, <laughs> we're glad to have you. You may not say it that way, but you might be thinking it that way. So now Gideon and his 300 are still in the chase. In verses 4 through 21, we find that two cities in Israel, Sukkoth and Penuel, give ridicule, ridicule to Gideon. When Gideon came to Jordan, or to the Jordan, 
He and the 300 who were with him crossed over, exhausted but still in pursuit. And then he said to the men of Sukkoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted. And I am pursuing, pursuing Ziba and Zalmina, king of Midian's. And the leaders of Sukkoth said, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmina now in your hand that we should give you bread to your army? So Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord delivers Ziba and Zalmunna, I know I've said that wrong every time, but that's how it's going to go tonight, into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. That sounds kind of rough. And then he went up from there to Penuel, and he spoke to them in the same way, and the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth and had answered. So he spoke to the men of Penuel, saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. Now Ziba and Zalmina were at Karkor with their armies, about 15,000, all who were left of the army of the people who fled from the east, for 120,000 men who drew swords had fallen. Then Gideon went up by the road. Now, first of all, Gideon and the 300 had not killed the 120,000 of the Midianites. It was after the initial stage of the battle with the 300 that the rest of the men were called up to battle again. So we can envision the 32,000 came out to war against um, the Midianites. And also, the Bible tells us that the swords of the Midianites were against one another. So there was a lot of friendly casualty that took place as well. Back to verse 11. Then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in the tents of the east by Noba and Jagab, Jagaba and attacked the armies while at the camp felt secure. And Ziba and Zilmana fled. He pursued them. He took over the two kings of Midian. He routed the whole army. Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle from the ascent of Heres. And he caught the young men of the men of Sukkoth and interrogated him. And he wrote down for him the leaders of Sukkoth and the elders, 77 men. And he came to the men of Sukkoth and he said, Here are Ziba and Zalmina, whom you really ridiculed me, saying, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmina now in your hand that we should give bread to your weary men? So he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars and taught them a lesson. He taught the men of Sukkoth. And that's pretty severe but it's not as bad as he did to the men of Penuel. In verse 17, he tore down the tower of Penuel. He killed the men of the city and said of Ziba and Zemuel, what kind of men were those whom you killed at Tabor? And they said, as you are, so were they, each one resembling the son of a king. I just love that phrase. Each one resembling the son of a king. Should we not, as children of Jesus Christ resemble our Lord Jesus Christ, King Jesus. Shouldn't we reflect the kingship of Jesus in our lives as well? Verse 19, then he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. But he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw a sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a youth. So Ziba and Zubalin said, Arise yourself, kill us, for as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Ziba and Zubala. Last time I have to read those. And took the crescent ornaments that were on the camel's neck. And so the cities of Sukkoth, both and Penuel. Both had a great heritage in Israel. Sukkoth was where Jacob built his house when he first returned to the land of Israel after he had left for around 20 years and married his four wives, came back with his family. And Penuel was where Jacob had wrestled with the Lord, where the Lord gave him the name Israel, saying, no longer shall you be called Jacob, heel catcher, but Israel, 
prince of God or a man governed by God. But sadly, the move of God's spirit upon Gideon and the 300 was not yet realized by many of the Israelis. Therefore, their refusal to aid Gideon had Gideon vowed to return with judgment against them after the Lord delivered these kings into his hand. And what he said he would do, he did. He took and taught a lesson to the elders and the leaders in Sukkoth 77 and all, a lesson of thorns and briars. Again, that would be tough. And not only did he tear down the tower of Penuel as he promised he would, he ended up killing the men of the city, leaving the city of Penuel without any defense or any defenders. So the tower would be their defense, but the men were their defenders. And finally, we learned that Gideon's brother had been killed by these two Midianite kings. And because of that, he had them... He ended up killing them. He wanted his younger son to do that, but he ended up killing them himself. And for, perhaps he felt his right as kinsman redeemer. He needed to do this. The word of God tells us in Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made them. All humanity has been made in the image of God. And for those who take life, God said, then man needs to take the life of that murderer. Now, if Gideon's brother had been killed, brothers, plural, had been killed in battle, I don't believe that that would have been an issue for Gideon because that's the way of war. But it seems that they were not killed in battle, but nonetheless were still killed by these two kings. And as the avenger of blood, Romans thirty-five nineteen, the avenger of blood himself shall put the murderer to death, when he meets him, he shall put him to death. So that seems to be what's going on here. So after all this, the battle is over. He's offered monarchy. He's offered to be king and your son as well. The children of Israel came to him in verse 22 through 28, saying, rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. That's how God desired Israel to be a theocracy, a country that had been governed by God. That's how God initially set them up to be. He also knew one day that they would ask for a king. And we'll look at that on Sunday as we rehearse the history of Israel. Verse 24, Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give me the earrings of his plunder, for they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So I believe, I don't know which way to take this. I, I think he's, he's talking to the children of Israel. The children of Israel are not Ishmaelites. So I believe it's saying that the plunder came from the Ishmaelites who had sided with the Midianites. And it was customary, apparently, for Ishmaelites to wear earrings. So it's just, you know, some people have such customs. And so they spread out a garment. Each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold of the earrings he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Beside the crescent ornaments, the pendants, the purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian. And besides the chains that were around the camel's necks. So Gideon made it into an ephod and set it in his city of Orphra. So an ephod is, remember, the priests wore an ephod. So it speaks about a priestly garment. Here he made the garment, but there was no priest who filled the garment. He just set up the garment. So I don't know if it was like a statue-like garment it was a physical garment. It's made of gold. But it tells us that all Israel played the harlot there. It became a snare to Gideon and his house. And thus Midian was subdued for, before the children of Israel. So they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years. 
in the day of Gideon. So Gideon's request, the gold from the plunder, he took it and he made an ephod of gold, a divining instrument that became a snare to Gideon, his household, and all of Israel. It's kind of like making a golden image in Deuteronomy 27, 15. Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of his hand, of the craftsman, and sets it up. It says here in secret, but this was set up in public. And it became a snare to the children of Israel. Still, God gave them peace for 40 years. God's grace. Um, he's willing to stay his hand against the children of Israel, even though they began to drift away from him. He gave them peace during the lifetime of Gideon, even though Gideon began to stray away from the Lord. And the ephod became a snare to Gideon and his house as well. And we find that that has been repeated over and over again throughout history. So sat into a mighty man of valor, verses 29 through 35. Then Zerubbabel, remember that's Gideon's name that was given him. Zerubbabel, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house, and Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also born him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, in Ophrah of the Abarites. And so it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel played the harlot with the Baals, and made Baal Bereth their God. And thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Zerubbabel in accordance with the good that he had done for Israel. So Gideon's latter days were not as glorious as his humble beginnings. And this is often the case when God moves mightily upon individuals often it is hard for people to stay the course and it's a challenge for all people through whom god does a mighty work and so for those who are being an influence for you uh, whether uh, it could be me as a pastor or maybe through those who are in the Christian community via podcasts or teaching ministries that they have online. There's so many people. Maybe it's books that we read and, and we're just fans of certain people. Keep them in your prayers. Whether male or female, keep them in your prayers that God would be with them, that they would finish their race well. So, it was good that Gideon did not allow Israel to make him king. But I don't believe he should have ever made the ephod, nor had married many wives. In fact, though he declined the monarchy, he kind of lived as if he was a king. He had 70 sons. I, I'd mentioned this on Sunday and just kind of threw the question out there. How many wives would you have to have in order to have 70 sons? So I did a little research today, and I, no commentary that I found kind of pondered this question. Just my curiosity on this. Globally speaking, in 2023, the average size of family worldwide, the average family worldwide hovers around 3.45. So about three and a half people per family worldwide. And of course, we know that there are some countries where the families have many kids in their family and others, like our country, have a lot less. So given that statistic, three and a half people per family to have 70 sons, 
Gideon would have to have at least 20 or 21 wives. But that's not considering that he gave, that there were girls born. So that would throw in the equation maybe up to 30 or 40 wives. Now, there is the country of Singel that they average the highest of 10.80 per household, almost 11 people per household, which would mean that they have almost nine children in each household. So that birth weight would give Gideon at least needing eight to 16 wives. Either way, pretty high. He was living like a king, even though he denied the kingship. Even despite of all these things, God gave Israel peace for 40 years. That all changed in chapter 9. And it came from within Israel. Now I think it's significant that Gideon taught a lesson to the men of Sukkoth. Because we find in the end of chapter 8 there that Gideon had a concubine from Shechem. And uh, this would play in. It was actually confusing for a moment, Sukkoth and Shechem. But this would play in to how his 70 sons were treated after his death. So I put two verses down as key verses. Verses 56 and 57, where it says, Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. And all the evil men of Shechem, God returned on their own heads. On them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Zerubbabel. So though Gideon refused to be king and refused that for his sons as well, one son, Abimelech, seized upon the opportunity as soon as his dad died. Abimelech strived to be king. So I titled this section, The Man Who Sought to Be King. But we never read of God's Spirit coming on Abimelech like he had come upon Gideon and how the Spirit of God came upon all the judges of Israel, but not upon Abimelech. We do read, though, of a spirit of ill will that God sent to be between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. One through six, we find a murderous brother. Then Abimelech, the son of Zerubbabel, went up to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke to them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. Which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Zerubbabel reign over you? Or that one reign over you? Remember that I am your own flesh and bone. And his mother's brothers spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. And their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. So they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Barith, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. Then he went to his father's house at Orphra, and he killed his brother, 70 sons of Zerubbabel, on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Zerubbabel, was left because he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king besides the Terambith tree at the pillar that was at Shechem. So Shechem was where Joshua had delivered his last words to the children of Israel some 250 years earlier. At that time, Joshua challenged the children of Israel to choose to either serve God or to serve the gods of the land. And sadly, the men of Shechem, the descendants of Hamor, he they chose to side themselves with Abimelech. And so by this time, 
if we remember the history of Shechem, that the namesake of Shechem had actually raped Jacob's daughter, Dana. We learn this in Genesis chapter 34. And as a result of that, Simeon and Levi ended up, through some deception, ended up killing all the men and the boys of Shechem. Apparently not all. So they're still here in the land of Israel. They have a connection with the Israelis, and they have a connection with Gideon. And perhaps by this time, the Shechemites had a blended culture of the Canaanites and the Israelis together. And Abimelech's mother was a concubine of Gideon. She was from the city of Shechem. So Gideon or Abimelech took advantage of this. They paid him 70 pieces of silver, which he hired these hotheads to join him. And they killed the 70 brothers, 70 sons of Gideon, save one, Jotham, who had escaped. So Abimelech may have desired to rule over all of Manasseh, but his rule would be short-lived. Shechem's conspiracy with Abimelech would prove also to be their downfall. So call for justice. And this is Jotham. And this is 7 through 21. He first gives a parable. And then he goes on to actually prophesy what would happen to them. And he does this in the hearing of God. So he's calling God as judge between them. Notice what he says beginning in verse 7. Now when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim. And by the way, Mount Gerizim was the mountain of blessing. But he actually calls down a curse from this mountain. So he stood on top of Mount Gerizim and he lifted up a voice and cried out and said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The tree once said, the trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, ring over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, come and rule over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I cease my sweetness my good fruit to go and sway over trees. Then the tree said to the vine, you come and ring over us. But the vine said to them, should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men to go and sway over trees? Then all the trees said to the bramble, you shall ring over us. And the bramble said to the trees, if in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter under my shade. But if not, let fire come out from the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So here we get the trees, the cedars of Lebanon. So these were massive trees. Eventually, in comparison, Jotham is describing the men of Shechem as these trees and his brother Abimelech as this bramble, this tumbleweed. Guys, you've asked for a tumbleweed to be your king. So that was the parable. And then he said in verse 16, Now therefore, if you have acted in truth and sincerity, he actually uses those words twice, truth and sincerity. If you have acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Zerubbabel and his house and have done, him, done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you, risked his life, delivered you out of the hands of of Midian, and you have raised up against my father's house this day, and killed his seventy sons on a stone, and made Abimelech the son of his female servant king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. Then, if you have acted in truth and sincerity with Zerubbabel and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come from the men of Shechem and Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. 
and devourer of Bimelech, and Jetham ran away and fled and went to Beer, Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. So Jotham's parable against this bramble or tumbleweed brother of his became a curse from which God would play out over the next three plus years. Jotham let the men of Shechem know that his words were not only a challenge to them, but being spoken in the hearing of God, and thus knowing that ultimately Yahweh would judge their response. Like later on in 1 Samuel 24, 15, in a different situation, it would be said, Therefore let the Lord be judged, and judge between you and me, and see and plead my case, and deliver you out of my hands. So in a sense, Jotham is saying, let the Lord be judged in this situation. If you guys have done well in truth and sincerity, then all will be well. But if not, there's going to be a fire burning between you and your newly crowned king. So his parable regarding the trees, the hardwoods, the cedars of Lebanon, asking first the fruit trees, whether an olive or fig tree, then a grapevine, and finally the bramble or the tumbleweed. In the parable, the trees were seeking one to rule over them, but the fruit trees and the grapevine refused to cease from producing their fruit, whether the oil, the sweet and good fruit, the new wine, because they knew that these things brought blessing to both God and man. And I think it's why sometimes when people might be considering you for certain positions to, you know, take a step back and to think about the response. Is this going to benefit larger audience? Is it going to be to the glory of God or is it going to be to the glory of man? Is it better for me to just keep doing what I'm doing? That the fruit of my labors, whether oil, sweet, good fruit, or new wine, is bringing blessing to individuals, to God. So sometimes it's good to think these things through. May it be. It could be that God would be lifting us up to a higher position. At other times, it could be, become a trap for us. So it was after this parable that Jotham challenged the men of Shechem, and the challenge that he made between them, talking about the fire that would go between them, it actually became a reality as civil war broke out between the men of Shechem and King Abimelech. And it ended up devour, devouring them all. So God brings his judgment against the men of Shechem first. In verses 22 through 45, and before we read that, um, just a verse from Isaiah 30, verse 18. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is God of justice and blessed are all those who wait for him. So it took three years, but God began to bring justice to the sons of Gideon after Abimelech had reigned over three years in Israel. God sent the spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the crime done to the 70 sons of Zerubbabel might be settled and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem who aided him in the killing of his brothers. And the men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who passed by them along the way. And it was told to Abimelech, Now Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So they went out into the fields. They gathered grapes from the vineyard. They trod them. They made merry. 
And they went into the house of their God. They ate, they drank, and they cursed Abimelech. Then Gaal, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? And who is Shechem, that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Zerubbabel? And is not Zebul his officer? Serve the men of Hamar, the father of Shechem, but why should we serve him? If we, this people, are, were under my authority, then I would remove Abimelech. So there's the challenge. They found someone who was willing, at least boastfully said, hey, if I had these men, I would challenge the kingship of Abimelech. So he said to Abimelech, verse 29, increase your army and come out. Then Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard these words of Gaal, the son of Ebed. His anger was aroused and he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly and said, take note, Gaal, the son of Ebed and his brothers have come out to Shechem and here they are fortifying the city against you. Now, therefore, get up by night, you and the people who are with you, and lie in wait in the field. Verse 33. And it shall be as soon as the sun is up in the morning that you shall rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people are with, who are with him come out against you, you may then do to them as you find opportunity. So Abimelech and all the people who are with him rose by night. They lay in wait against Shechem, in four companies. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, went out against and stood in the entrance of the city. And Abimelech and the people who were with him arose from lying in wait. Then Gaal, when he saw the people, said to Zebul, Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. But Zebul said to him, You see the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. So Zebul said, You're just seeing things. It's not real. So Gaal spoke again and said, See, People are coming down from the center of the land. Another company is coming up from the diviner's terebinth tree. Then Zebul said to him, Where indeed is your mouth now with which you said, Who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Are not these the people whom you despise? Now go out, if you will, fight with them now. So Gaal went out, leading the men of Shechem, and fought against Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled from him. And they fell wounded to the very entrance of the gate. And Abimelech dwelt at Aramah, and Zebul drove out Gaal and his brothers so that they would not dwell in Shechem. And it came about on the next day that people went out into the field, and they told Abimelech, so he has taken his people divided them into three companies and lay in wait in the field. And he looked, and there were the people coming out of the city, and he arose against them, attacked them. And Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward, stood at the entrance of the city gate. So they blocked the city gate. And the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the fields and killed them. So Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He took the city, he killed the people who were in it, he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. The, the spirit of ill will that God sowed between Abimelech and the men of Shechem now became the downfall of the men of Shechem. It's reminded me of the spirit of the Lord that departed from Saul in the days of King Saul in 1 Samuel sixteen fourteen, And the word tells us there that the Lord sent a distressing spirit from the Lord to trouble Saul. So God can use spirits, whether good or evil, to do his bidding. And here he had this spirit of ill will that caused this battle that ultimately not only destroyed the men of Shechem, but Abimelech destroying their city and sowing it with salt, meaning that the lands would be unproductive for many years. So again, this spirit of ill will we often forget that the battles in this world are not merely fleshly, but also spiritual. Ephesians six twelve says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, 
against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. So yes, there were physical warfare going on, but there was a spirit of ill will that came from God. This was spiritual warfare as well. Second, we discover that in his short three-plus-year reign, the Shechemites turned against Abimelech, becoming mountain bandits and ultimately weakening his kingdom. And when drawn out to battle, Abimelech were able to kill the men of Shechem. Because they had, re they had helped Abimelech by paying money that led to the death of Gideon's 70 sons. Psalm 616 tells us his trouble returned to his own head. His violent dealings shall come down in his own crowd, crown, and surely that happened to the men of Shechem. But there was also the men of the Tower of Shechem. We'll look at that in verses 46 through 57, where judgment comes against Abimelech as well. Now when all the men of the Tower of Shechem had heard that, they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god of Bereth. So the Tower of Shechem, apparently separate from the city of Shechem, maybe a separate city. It was told that Abimelech, that these men were taking refuge, not in the tower, but in the temple. Verse 47, Abimelech, that all of the men of the Tower of Shechem were gathered together. So Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him, and Abimelech took an axe, and he cut down a branch from the trees, and he took it, and he laid it on his shoulder, and he told his people to do the same thing as I have just done. So they made haste and did so. Verse 49, the people likewise cut down his own bow and followed Abimelech, or their own branch, and followed Abimelech, and they came against the stronghold. They set the stronghold on fire with these branches. And all the people of the Tower of Shechem died, about a thousand men and women. Then Abimelech went to Thebes. And he encamped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower in the city, and all the men and women, all the peoples of the city fled there and shut themselves in. Then they went to the top of the tower. So Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it. He drew near the door of the tower and burned it with fire. So he's going to burn them out just as he did to the men and women of the tower of Shechem. He set fire to the door of the uh, tower. In verse 53, but a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. So I don't know how big this millstone was. I mean, some mill, millstones were, they could be up to four to five feet in diameter and very thick. Obviously, if this is being thrown from the top of the tower, it's probably much smaller, but still from the distance, it did its job. It crushed his skull, but he didn't die. In verse 54, he quickly called to a young man, his armor bearer, said to him, draw your sword, kill me, lest men save me, a woman killed him. So the young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man to his place. So God, causing the spirit of ill will between, to come between these two, the men of Shechem and the men of Abimelech, we find that God repaid. Justice came for the killing of the sons of Gideon. Abimelech and those who had sided with him were all put to death. Justice was served. But this tower incident, David would remember it many years later. In fact, when after he had sinned with Bathsheba, and he had actually arranged that Uriah, Bathsheba's real husband at that time, would be killed in battle. The battle report was being gave to David, and he had not yet learned that Uriah had died. 
Joab sent a messenger to David and said, When you have finished telling him the matters of the war of the king, if it happens that the king, king's wrath arises, say to him, Why did you... So this is Joab envisioning what David would say. So he's preparing the young man to respond. He says, If the king says to you, why did you approach so near the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech? So he remembers this. Was it not a woman who cast a millstone? Abimelech said, don't let it be said that I was killed by a woman. And hundreds of years later, David said, wasn't it a woman who killed Abimelech? And so he would say, why did you go to the wall? And then he said, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So he prepared him. And they remembered this. In fact, the battle tactic that Abimelech would use would also be used in the wars of the kings of blocking the city, not allowing people to go back into the safety of a city. So we close out 56 and 57. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech which he had done to his fathers by killing his 70 brothers and all the evil of the men of Shechem. God returned to their own heads and on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Zerubbabel. So a sad story of death and destruction for this man who sought to be king. Sadly, this sad story has been repeated throughout the ages. And we can take some lessons from this. I picked out three and we'll close with these three lessons. These biblical accounts of people's lives that we read about from the Old and New Testament, whether good or bad, they are given to us for examples. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 reminds us, now these things happen to them as examples. They were written for our admonition upon the ends of the ages, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So these things were written for our learning these accounts that we find in Scripture, we can learn from them. Maybe we don't seek to be king. Let's think about a church situation where a pastor leaves. Maybe the Lord takes him home, he dies. Maybe he suddenly resigns and a church is left without a pastor and there could be many people within the congregation suddenly thinking, I would make a good pastor. And they would be rallying people to their cause, gathering people like Abimelech did with the men of Shechem. And maybe even doing a little dirty character assassinations, maybe not literally killing anyone, but harming people with words. Oh, that has been repeated often. It happens in government. It happens in corporations. It happens in churches. So these things are written for our examples that we should learn from them. Second, this is a good example of we reap what we sow. Those the last two verses of chapter 9, verses 56 and verses 57. God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech God repaid the men of Shechem. We reap what we sow. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever we sow that we will also reap. And finally, there should be only one king that rules over our lives. King Jesus. In Revelation nineteen sixteen. John got a glimpse of Jesus and he describes it this way, saying, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Jesus, we, we do await your return. But while we await your return, help us, Lord, to be faithful to your word, faithful to you, and pray your Lord blessing, your blessing be upon us and upon this church and our families. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.